Hi, I'm Janet Deneef, founder and director of the Ubud Writers and Readers Festival. You are about to hear one of our highlight conversations recorded live for our 2022 festival, which explored the role of the written word in upholding humanity's values and freedoms through our festival theme, Mamayu Hayuning Bawana, Uniting Humanity. So please settle in and let the magic of our 19th festival continue. Welcome to the festival if this is your first day and welcome to a beautiful interruption for the way that we're going to kick off today's conversation on climate change in the Australasian region. Um, hello. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's wonderful to see you all turning up for an issue because we will actually be sinking into climate change and solving the issue in the one hour that we have today. So, um, you know, stick with us. I'm sure we'll find it a great conversation. We'll have um, some time for you to ask some questions or add some reflections towards the end of the session. Um, my name's Claire O'Rourke. I'm a climate activist, strategist, um, communications expert, and I've written the book here, Together We Can, um, which we might touch on a little bit in our conversation today. But what's more important is for me to introduce our fabulous panellists for this conversation today. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, First, I'd like to introduce Andita Utami, who's better known as Afu. Um, Afu is an environmental act economist, an activist and a writer, wearing many hats, as we all do for the fight that we have for our planet. Her work focuses on the intersection between the environment and economics, and as an environmental economist, she conducts research and provides advice to the government of Indonesia to make the economic case for key policy reforms to address the climate crisis. Um, Afu also founded Think Policy, which is a movement to improve participation in policy making, which I'm a big fan of. Um, and you've also recently published a book that explores the paradoxical relationship between the environment and the economy. So two big systems at play here. Um, and you produce video essays on your YouTube channel and perform spoken word poetry. So go and check out YouTube. Please do welcome Afu today. Thank you. Now, next I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Tom Doig, who writes non-fiction about disasters, the coal industry and the climate crisis. So we'll be getting it quite cheery at that point in our conversation. Mm -hmm. um, fantastic book you can see here, Hazelwood, which was published by Penguin Random House in 2020, which is a finalist for the 2020 Walkley Book Award, Australia's premier um, book awards for journalism, and the 2021 Ned Kelly Awards, and was highly commended in the 2020 Victorian Premier's Literary Awards. Um, Tom is the contributing editor of Living With Climate Change, um, Voices for Aotearoa, which I'm terrible at saying, and Tom lectures in creative writing at the University of Queensland in Brisbane. Please do welcome Dr. Tom Doig. <laughs> and Daryl Jones, who is like, I think the bird came to visit you, Daryl, to pay <laughs> tribute today. I was still here. Building a nest up there. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> um, so Daryl Jones is an Australian scientist, lecturer and researcher based in Malaysia. His work is mostly focused on how people interact with nature and his goal is to effectively communicate science to a broader audience. And he has done this by writing multiple popular science articles as well as almost 200 scientific papers. And Daryl has also published nine books, which is a remarkable in achievement in and of itself. Um, including Birds at My Table, 2018, A Clouded Leopard in the Middle of the Road, which was published this year, and another book this year, Curlews on Vulture Street. Please do welcome Daryl Jones to our conversation today. So we're going to have a pretty broad-ranging conversation, and so I thought we would start by grounding ourselves in the place that we're in. Um, Afu, your work stretches across a broad range of topics. You've analysed the performance of Indonesia's village funds, which is an experiment in fiscal decentralisation. And you've also investigated fire management, oceans, land use and natural capital. So what have you learned about how humans approach the environment and the economy through this substantial and broad-ranging body of work? Yeah, thanks for that very important question. I just want to say hi uh, and good morning first to everyone. Uh, what a pleasure to be here. Um, I think. In the course of uh, my work focusing on environmental economics, right, there are two most fundamental uh, things that I, I discovered. The first one is uh, that our fetish 
I'll call it a fetish, because this is, if there's a place where I can call it a fetish, it's here, on GDP growth, has set out an economic logic that makes it difficult for, uh, to make the case for the environment. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, what, what people need to understand is that we, it hasn't always been this way, right? I mean, this concept of measuring how healthy the economy is by way of measuring the outputs of um, you know, how much we're consuming, how much we're producing, and how much we're investing uh, is not natural, right? It, it's, it's made up. So uh, in, about 19 th in the 1930s, after the Great Depression in the US, one economist, uh, Simon Kuznets, uh, came up to the US Congress and proposed uh, the GDP as a way to uh, kind of indicate, in order to avoid another Great Depression, you know, maybe this is a way that we can measure how healthy the economy is. But what happened since then is that a lot of people, um, especially the capitalists, I would say, um, kind of turn that as a justification to kind of to, 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 to make it the most um, important measure on how uh, the economy should look like, right? And so because of that, whenever you want to argue for fire prevention or keeping the oceans uh, healthy, whenever you want to argue for climate change, not using coal, things become difficult because then a lot of the costs uh, that those, uh, you know, unsustainable, uh, un irresponsible uh, economic options are um, causing are not measured necessarily into the GDP, right? So um, that's kind of like one of the most difficult uh, challenge that I find at the beginning of this fight. And that's the reason why I decided to uh, go and, and learn, I, I usually call it like learning the language of the people in power, uh, where I went on and studied economics and public policy, even though I know that what I want to, uh, you know, solve is climate change. Everyone is saying, oh, you should learn, you know, environmental science or, uh, you know, environmental engineering. But, but I, I, to me, it feels like at the core of uh, the climate crisis, it's about how the economic systems needs to change, the incentives within the system needs to change such that uh, we're measuring the right things. And so in the past, uh, thankfully, I think the past decade at least, uh, there's a growing literature on uh, you know, how we need to go beyond GDP, right? Um, um, Bhutan actually started with uh, what maybe a lot of people here know about the gross national uh, happiness index, right? So instead of just measuring economic outputs, they decided to also include, um, you know, things like um, health uh, measurements or environmental impacts as well, and, and, and so on and so forth. So um, in economics, uh, there's this term called externalities, right? Wh which is basically all these invisible costs uh, that are not being measured and uh, and 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 is supposed to be uh, included in the in the activity, but is excluded because they're not directly involving the uh, the sellers and buyers in the in the transaction of economy. And so, when we talk about climate change in Indonesia, there's huge you know externalities, right? That that the GDP is not capturing uh, necessarily. In 2015 and 2019, there were huge forest fire uh, and peat fire events uh, that took place mostly in Sumatra and Kalimantan. It caused, uh, I mean, it, it caused schools to close down. It stopped, um, you know, tourism and transport and, and travels in, 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 in these places. It stopped the economy effectively. People cannot do anything. Can, they cannot get out of their houses. And it also the haze travels, obviously, to Malaysia and Singapore, and it caused a lot of a lot of problems. Um, one of our research actually found, finds out that the 2015 uh, episode in particular uh, has resulted in economic loss twice the si size of Aceh tsunami in 2005. Mm. Twice the size. So it's huge. But because you know events like fires, um, first of all, when they don't take place in Java or like where, where the government is, it, it feels like remote. And, and you know the decision makers in Java think that, oh, you know, this is I mean, it, it doesn't occur directly to them how bad it was, first, first of all. But also, secondly, a lot of these costs are, 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 are borne by um, the people directly, right? It's not measured in, uh, in the economy directly in the sense that it, it's causing uh, prosperity diseases. Uh, you know, there are some linkages directly to the economy, but by and large, it's not. Um, and then, for example, um, in Indonesia, climate change also means harvest failures, basically, prolonged and more frequent uh, dry seasons, um, how the smallholder farmers uh, in Java back in 2018 or 19, if I'm not mistaken, there's like a, more than uh, uh, 180 or 90 days where there's no rain at all and it's causing uh, harvest failures in at least 100 districts. So all of that has real economic impact, but sometimes 
um, you know, you measure it as an afterthought and, 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 and you keep thinking that, oh, we need to burn our coal because, you know, we need energy, we need to produce all of these things because the growth imperative uh, from, from GDP is, is there. It's kind of like your main uh, measurement of progress and, and development, right? And so, I mean, if, I mean, I, in the, at the beginning, uh, I thought the fight is about making, learning on how to measure all of those environmental impacts into economic terms so that the same people in power can understand that it matters. But then I think like more and more I realized that as long as the underlying paradigm of this fetish for like growth imperative and GDP as a, as a way to measure progress change, as long as it, it doesn't change, then fundamentally we're, we're fighting in a losing game basically. Because the game is set out such that it sets you uh, for failure because you, no matter what you do, the, the main uh, you know, economic outputs like con over consumerism, all of that will always win because people will still justify it uh, towards that direction. Now, so, yeah. so climate change, thank you. Yeah. So climate change, as Naomi Klein writes in the foundational book, which I'm sure many of you have read, this changes everything. Like climate change is ultimately intersectional. It will touch every aspect of our lives, including our economic systems. But she also writes about sacrifice zones. And so, mm -hmm. um, Tom, if I could move to you, you know, you wrote extensively about the Hazelwood Mine Fire, which is on Gano Kano country in Victoria, in Australia, which was one of the kind of biggest times in our recent history mm. when the direct impacts of the fossil fuel industry were felt by a regional community that depended on it for its livelihood, for its economic success. Mm -hmm. And to give you a sense of this mine, and <laughs> it's just colossal how big this mine is, it's one of the biggest coal mines in the world. It's seven kilometres wide, four kilometres long, one billion cubic litres of land has been displaced by this mine. Um, these days the mine is closed and it presents a colossal rehabilitation dilemma in Australia. It's, it's almost too overwhelming to cost. So what did the experience for you, Tom, of writing about the lived experience of people in the Latrobe Valley teach you about the lasting impacts of the fossil fuel industry for the people not only for the fire, but for mm. what's come since. Thanks, Claire. Um, it's great. And hello, everybody. Terima kasih. Um, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Tom Takoingoa. So I'm from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be here um, at a festival with real live people. Um, so yeah, so look, the, as you can probably tell from the cover of this book, there's a kind of like giant, this isn't a volcano, this is a um, coal mine that's on fire. Mm. Um, and this is the edge of the, the giant rim of the, of the open-cut coal mine that, that um, Claire mentioned. But the lights, and so that's the fire, that's the fire, that's the fire, that's the town. <laughs> that is not the fire, that's the town. And so not only is the mine gigantic, but it's 400 metres away from a town of Morwell. And Morwell is, was built directly downwind from the, from the mine. So, so when, and so there was a sort of a perfect storm, really, in, in 2013, there'd been unprecedented um, droughts, unprecedented heat waves, and then this, this huge forest fire kicked up. I mean, lo lots of very stupid planning decisions as well, decades of them, that's why the book's quite thick, um, in including building eucalypt plantations upwind um, from oh. the coal mines. So, so the, the fire um, kicked off, burnt into the um, eucalypts, it kind of exploded, um, raining, raining um, embers into the coal mine, and because the coal mine was privatized in the 90s, <laughs> with the, the wisdom of neoliberal economics and the growth imperative, um, part of the privatization process was like, oh, like safety is quite expensive, so just don't worry about it, you know? Don't worry about replacing the sprinkler system. Don't worry about employing like safety staff. Like, mm. don't, don't worry about that stuff. Don't mm. worry about covering over the flammable coal fields that stress for hundreds of acres. And so it just, lit up and when it lights up we're talking about cracks in the ground that are sort of five ten fifteen twenty meters deep and so once you've got coal um and it, it burnt for three months you know like it was it was fairly nuts i just want to read you a, a little bit from the book to give you a taste of this so so this all kicked off um in, in february and in australia there's there's volunteer firefighters and so this is doug steely who um as a volunteer went in to try and sort this out and it was it was a real schmozzle um <laughs> sorry I'll, I'll do a bit more prefacing to get there because it's, it's just such a such a comedy of errors um so they're in one of the biggest kind of uh power stations in the state of victoria but there's no power <laughs> because 
<laughs> All the power inside the mine was connected by wooden power lines and they burned and fell over and no one had thought, oh, maybe we should have a backup generator or like a diesel generator. So they're in, inside this power um, station with no power in the dark um, and these, these poor firefighters are trying to put out the biggest industrial disaster in, in Victoria's history. Just on dawn, Doug Steely's truck followed a GDF Suez, and so that's the company, rebranded as Angie Group, um, big French utility, and they love sponsoring COP as well, like, good on them. Um, GDF Suez escort to the third to top level of the northern batters. They relieved another volunteer fire crew that had been stationed there all night. Doug and his friend Ken took a few steps towards the fire. It took Doug a little while to comprehend what they were looking at. There were vast banks of red-hot, glowing coal, curtains of thick blue-gray smoke rising from them. The air scorched his face. Imagine as far as you can see, the ground itself is burning. The trees are still there, but the earth underneath the trees is burning. On the banks nearest to them, the blaze had been stopped. On the right by a patch of functioning sprinklers, on the left by a water pipe that had, water, water pipe that had sprung a leak, creating an inadvertent waterfall down the terraces. On one side of the waterfall, the coal faces were covered with grass and trees, planted years ago by GDF Suez. They were not on fire. On the other side of the waterfall, the coal faces were exposed, and they were ablaze. Doug and Ken stared at the burning hill, overwhelmed by the futility of their task. It's not going anywhere, Ken said, but we're not going to be able to put it out. It's going to burn for at least a month. It's a bloody waste of time, Doug shot back. By this point, he'd been on duty without a break for 30 hours. Um, by now, it was early morning, and there was no wind, making carbon monoxide poisoning a risk. The gas is invisible, odorless, and deadly in high concentrations. It's also heavier than air, so during fires it collects at the bottom of valleys. Um, and they're just there working in it. Um, a Hazelwood worker gave, had given Doug's crew carbon monoxide monitors, but no, nobody knew what the readings meant. The only instructions were, if it goes off in a long, continuous beep, get out of there. <laughs> Doug and Ken's CFA dust masks offered no protection from the gas. Um, there was no escort to take them to the bottom of the mine and no clear directions of how to get there, but Doug's crew followed their noses down, taking one wrong turn after the no another, backtracking and reversing. Eventually, they made it to the mine floor. If they had to try and escape from a fast-moving fire on these tracks, Doug thought, they'd all be toast. From the bottom of the cut, the walls of coal towered 130 metres overhead. Smoke poured out of the hillside from a million cracks. Every few seconds, Doug's carbon monoxide monitor let out a faint, high-pitched beep. And I'll just read one a little bit more. Um, Doug's crew watched the fire burning into the coalface. When you're standing there, he said, it fills the horizon. It's all you can see. You can feel the heat against your face. You can see the giant cracks of the earth opening up and the glowing red embers inside. Holy bloody hell, the whole hill is on fire. So that's just like a little bit. And that was just the very first morning. And there were literally thousands of people trying and failing to get the, the fire under control. Um, and I guess, I guess what really drew it to me as a, drew, drew me to this story as a, as a writer and a researcher is what a kind of potent metaphor I saw it for the sort of apocalyptic climate future that we'd been worried about. And, and it's like, well, in, in this fire, it's here, right? Like the, the image of the ground itself burning away and the, the trees being okay, but the, the earth kind of um, not. Um, but the other thing that's crazy is this was eight and a half years ago. And at the time, it was like one of the worst disasters in the state of Victoria's history. By the time the book came out in 2020, it was like, oh, this is like the third or fourth worst disaster in the last eight years. Mm. Um, because, you know, because the, the fires of 2019, 2020 were just so appalling, and then, and then COVID happened. So mm. when I was writing this book, I sort of thought I was writing about this like, horrific future vision that might take us 20 or 30 years to get to, and we're, we're already here. Mm. And I find that um, interesting. <laughs> interesting. Well, what's, what I find really interesting is that this series of disasters, of which Hazelwood was the first, mm. has developed into a kind of monumental shift in Australia's politics. So mm. we've had a general election this year which has seen, you know, a, a shift in government but also new suite of independent community candidates who have, you know, engaged thoroughly on the issue of climate and been put in office because of it. And that is an entirely, you know, productive consequence of some of these horrendous disasters that have hurt so many people. 100%. Um, yeah, so there is, there are, you know, I'm and, not and a some of that some of that actually started in the Latrobe Valley, right? That's right. So when this fire kicked off, there was a sort of instant grassroots protest 
community activism and Voices of the Valley was Voices of the name. Valley, they're mm. awesome. Shout out Wendy Farmer, awesome. Um, who was literally like a, you know a very chill kind of like literally like a stay at home Rotary mum who whose husband worked in in the coal mine and got quite quite sick from it, and she like. Well, luckily for her and for the Latrobe Valley, they had a rat bag daughter who went to uni and became a socialist agitator. <laughs> and, and Naomi Farmer came back and was like, Mum, you know, you've got to organise a protest. And so, mm. and Naomi, like, you know, kicked them off. And, it, and the protest was huge. It was like the biggest protest in Morwell and the Latrobe Valley's history. And then they, they set up with some help an uh, independent candidate for, for the local uh, elections, um, this, this woman called Tracy Lund, who was, who was awesome. And she didn't win, but she, she pushed the, the local sort of right-wing guy right to the edge of nearly losing his seat. And because of that, the state government paid attention and went, all right, we're going to fund you. We're scared of this marginal seat. And so it, it did really transform politics. And that movement, I would say, led directly, if not, yeah, definitely, indirectly, possibly directly to the, the whole teal wave that, mm. that swept Australia with the kind of centrist environmental um, candidates. And in Victoria, the state government has um, decided to, if it's re-elected, which it probably will be, decided to put um, new electricity infrastructure, renewables infrastructure, into public ownership. So re-nationalising some of our infrastructure, which is almost unheard of when we think about those, um, you know, neoliberal economic agenda that we've been subjected to for too long. Um, but Daryl, if I could move to you, because we're kind of opening some small windows of hope hope already in this conversation. Um, one of your areas of interest is urban ecology and conservation. And you write of what's called road ecology, which is a, a term that has a bit of cognitive dissonance for me. Um, but that's what you write about in A Clouded Leopard in the Middle of the Road. Um, particularly, you write of projects um, in the European Union's um, remit. It's called defragmentation, this mm. project. And that's building wildlife crossings across roadways and railway lines from Sweden to Romania and, and in many other places across borders to allow animals to cross safely. Could you tell us more about these projects um, and how they're succeeding in helping wild animal populations survive the consequences of urbanisation? Yeah, that sounds... Thanks very much for, for um, inviting me here. This is such a, such a privilege to be here. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, so they, they, that might seem strange and trivial and, and microscopic in terms of the big things we're talking about. But I want, um, what I'm trying to do with, with this book, um, with the strange title, A Clouded Leopard in the Middle of the Road, is trying to get people to think, for pa perhaps for the first time, just what roads do and what they're for. Because we never actually think about roads. We just get in our car or our taxi or whatever and go from A to B and get out the other end. We never, and we hope that it's... A short trip and a straight trip. That's all we ever care about. And yet the road network is the biggest artefact of, a, of human endeavour mm. ever. It's the biggest thing because it covers the entire globe in a network, a network. So, and a network is little bits with roads on every side. Mm -hmm. And so what's been going on has been, without anybody really noticing, the fragmentation of the natural landscape or, or every landscape, cities, farms everything's been cut up into little bits mm -hmm. and those little bits are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and so what the problem is if you want nature to thrive and just exist anywhere where people are um, you have to allow the nature not to be s confined to a tiny little island surrounded by roads um, but to allow things to move around in the landscape and so this weird thing called road ecology is actually an attempt to try and think about how can, we, how can we take it seriously? What's the fragmentation of this go stuff going on? Uh, and what can we do about it? And so that's really what's going on. So what I, what I might do is, is, is tell you the anecdote that, that led to the title of the book. So I was extremely privileged. To, this is ridiculous. I'm an academic at a university in Australia. And for eight years, I was, I was paid to take students to the deepest jungles in Sabah in, in Malaysian Borneo, just the most extraordinary place. And every student that went there, just about every student went there was profoundly affected by it. It was just incredible. What we would do is we would arrive, we, would, we went from Kutik, Kutik in Abala, which is the capital of Sabah, across in a, in a couple of minibuses, and then we'd stop at the gate to this giant national park with, with um, the Malio Basin, which is this place right in the middle of it where we, we're going to be going staying. And 
for the first six years of, that, of those trips, um, the, we would get out of the minibuses and wait for these four-wheel drives to come from the station way deep in the jungle and they'd come through this tiny little muddy track and pick us up and take us back to the station. And we, it's just a literal muddy track mm. going through and disappearing into the jungle. And, and one day, and we're all waiting there, we're waiting for the four-wheel drives to turn up. And the students are so excited. Now, many of them have never been overseas at all. And they're saying, what are we going to see? What are we going to see? You know, and uh, are we going to see hornbills? Oh, we'll see all, all eight species of hornbills. It's incredible. What are, we, are we going to see orangutans? Sorry, no orangutans at this part of Borneo. They're a bit further around. And somebody said, could we see a clouded leopard? And I went, <laughs> clouded leopard is one of the rarest mammals in the world. It's just incredible, except there's one that's there. <laughs> Just there, 80 metres away, looking at us. <laughs> which meant that they I had no credibility forever after that. <laughs> <laughs> but my point was, I was saying, that's a clouded leopard. It was just standing in the track wow. and then melted into the landscape on either side. Wow. And I went, my goodness, I can die happy now. I mean, that's, mm. that was just an extraordinary experience. Mm. That contrasts with exactly one year later. Exactly one year later, we turn up with this, another group of students... And I look out, and what had been a single track disappearing into the jungle had been cleared 100 metres wide, and it was a concrete two-lane highway going directly through the jungle, which was now had a vast track through it. Now, not only is this going to a dead-end place at the end, where the, they, this is the government wanting to get people to go there as tourists. Mm. It's too remote. And, though in a, and, and admittedly, the track was terrible. It was a muddy, horrible track. But they, it was absolutely classic overkill. And there's just so many layers, and I'm not going to go into the deep, deep depths here, but so many layers of, of bureaucracy and corruption as a result of this. This road was 20 times bigger than it needed to be. It didn't need to be cleared so far. Mm. But the point is, for my story, is that there's no way that a clouded leopard or virtually anything will ever cross that space. Mm. That's now... It might as well be a brick wall, you know. Mm. It's not going to happen. And so that's just, that was a vivid, personal, mm. deeply affecting metaphor for what's going on all around the world because roads are still being constructed but at the greatest rate in the, in the developing world and in places where there's never been roads. So there's, it's, it's just, I guess, another symptom of the way the economic system is impacting on the natural world and, and something I, I'm very concerned about. And can you say a little bit about the solutions that you've identified as well that you write about? You know, how, how is this being rectifi rectified in some places? Absolutely. So you did mention the defragmentation, that, which is a, it's a terrible <laughs> translation from the French, which sounds a lot better. Mm. Um, it's simply, it's, we've fragmented the landscape and in Europe. Anything that's left, Europe's had a tough time in terms of the, la in the last couple of hundred years, where they've just been fight fighting each other forever. Uh, and so the, any bits of natural landscape are incredibly valuable. In fact, they are described as being irreplaceable and un... What's the word? Um, they don't have a, a, a price. It's, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're impossibly valuable to the peoples of Europe. And so if you want to pull and put some new infrastructure in, a, you know, a road, a railway, a power pipeline, any, anything at all, and you're going to impact one of these many little spots that are left in Europe, you have to show why, you have, why it's necessary and how can, what can be done about it. So as a result of that, all linear infrastructure in Europe is, is required to be designed in such a way that it has the absolute minimum impact on what's left. Basically, there's almost nothing left. So the little bits that are left are so, invalu so invaluable that we, we've got to con conserve them. And so they, that Europe has led to a, an extraordinary creative flow of amazing things that, that allow animals, but everything, all biodiversity, to cross despite the roads being there. There's tunnels under roads, there's big bridges over the roads, there's, there's all sorts of different things, structures designed for animals to move across and, they, and safely, and they work like a dream. So this book, which starts with the tragedy of, what, that, of the clouded leopard not ever going to cross that road, is actually was written with the distinct um, intention of showing a terrible thing is going on around the world, but we've got ways to fix it, and we can, and we're doing it. So it's, it's a hopeful sign. So 
We're really talking about the kind of, you know, intersection or moving between two worlds and that's certainly something that you're doing every day, Afu, not least through your poetry but also through your professional work working on environment and um, the economy. But I think um, what you really touch on in your writing is the need for critical thinking and could you say more about that and um, more about how we need to be thinking systemically around how these systems connect? Yeah, uh, sure. So... I just want to check if the room is already uh, between one to four, how depressed are we already <laughs> in this room talking about all these problems? Mm -hmm. uh, because whenever, you know, like climate change panel is always about like all the dooms and glooms. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that I think like we can talk a little bit more about the solutions and, and the hope uh, that's needed, right? Um, so yeah, in terms of um, the, the how, like how I try to engage uh, the audience on this topic, so I, I feel like so why critical thinking becomes the entry point for me and, and I think like the way I define critical thinking also in my soon to uh, be published next, next week book uh, is on basically first of all in terms of self-awareness and understanding that it's okay to care about the environment. I think there's this huge barrier of identity when it comes to being an environmentalist. Like people feel like uh, it's almost like being a monk, like to care about the environment <laughs> And to call yourself an environmentalist means changing your lifestyle from A to Z. And it can be daunting. It can be a lot of people are not ready yeah. to uh, call themselves like a green person or whatever it is and, and to change, right? And so my first entry point, like in, in the book, I talk about how labels uh, and roles and names that people call us often limits what we think is possible or limits our actions. It creates expectations and uh, kind of like this cage where we feel like, oh, as a, um, you know, whatever it is, I need to act in a certain way. Um, so that's my first entry point, just kind of like allowing people to explore, look inward deeper and, and liberate themselves from, from the labels and just like thinking that it's okay to start caring about the environment even though, you know, you're not perfect yet. You don't have to call yourself any labels just to try to do better every day. Um, secondly, critical thinking in terms of looking outward. So look, both looking inward and looking outward and thinking about, um, you know, allowing yourself to question the existing systems that we live in. So even like allowing your, yourself to ask, you know, what is this neoliberal um, economic system that we're in? And, and allowing yourself to ask if like a, a, a different system is possible, right? Because I think when I talk to a lot of people, sometimes they feel like, yeah, Afu, like I understand you wanna, you know, you think that the economic system needs to change, but there's no way that it can change. Like it's been, it's always been like this. Mm -hmm. Democracy has always been like this. The political system has never worked for us. Mm -hmm. We cannot, you know, compel the government to do things differently. So yeah. I understand there's climate change, but there's nothing that we can do about it. So I feel like at the core, that's like that's the biggest barrier uh, for people to take action is that they don't think change is possible. Um, so instead of just talking about the problem and you know how all this like doom and gloom, I try to I try to focus on helping people to leap forward and think that you know it hasn't always been like this. We can change the way that we measure um, progress, that we, we we measure development, um, and if we can just shift the allow ourselves to shift the paradigm a little bit and think about a different world that's possible, uh, then that would allow that will compel more people to take action. And I, I usually refer to the movement of equality, for example. Let's, let, let's say, you know, racial equality in the US or gender equality everywhere else. We talk a lot about how represent, representation is so important. You need to see that a woman can, can, can uh, you know, hold office or that, you know, people from different colors can, can play in movies and things like this. It's so important that you can visualize what's possible for that change to happen, right? And so mm -hmm. this is precisely what's still missing. I think there's, you know, shift towards that direction, but there's still a huge gap that needs to be filled in terms of what kind of future, what is this visualization of a world that's possible when it comes to addressing climate change? What's, uh, you know, a redistributive, regenerative economy would look like? What is, uh, you know, a decentralized economy that doesn't, that, that can be agnostic towards kind of like centralized growth, but cares more about, you know, uh, furthering local economies, uh, you know, community-based economic systems uh, that are just, that are circular, uh, that is efficient in utilizing the natural resources that we already have instead of kind of just like exploiting more and more natural resources from the ground in order to, for the sake of the growth imperative, just for the sake mm -hmm. of growth without any like real purpose. So to me, that's the, the other like critical thinking part in terms of allowing ourselves to first imagine 
uh, what is you know a new post-capitalistic economic system that's possible that is that is actually nice for everyone to like when we first like think about equality or like uh, you know inclusion we're afraid that it's just gonna cost us like that it's it, it, it's not gonna make the world better but like once mm. people understand oh representation is important inclusion is important then they, they they make the shift right so this is the same with with climate change we need to to think about like how great you know uh, this like how freeing an economic system where you don't have to overconsume all the time just for the economic machine mm. machineries mm. to work right mm. and how actually that I mean, even spiritually, that, that can be a lot more fulfilling rather than like thinking about rushing towards the next cool thing and like having to have new everything every year. Um, yeah, well, that's what's so interesting is that that vision is something that I certainly ascribe to and, yeah. you know, write about. But that's very difficult for some people to grasp. And that's why, Tom, I'd love you to talk about your work that you're, you've just done most recently mm. on the preppers movement. So these are folks who have responded to the state of the world by being more than ready for the worst. Mm -hmm. um, and you've focused on your home country. Could you tell us more about the people you've met? Particularly, tell us about Richard. Oh, I will tell you about Richard, but I'll, I'll tell you about um, Ollie as well. So, <laughs> so thank you, yeah. So, so I, hope, I hope you're all, well, do I hope, I, I assume you're all familiar with the idea of preppers, um, doomsday preppers, or you don't have to be worried about doomsday. I think it's the idea, it's people who are, worried that things are going to fall apart. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, a few years ago that was like crazy fringe right-wing American gun nuts. Now it's like climate scientists and anyone who reads the newspaper. <laughs> um, but yeah, and especially since COVID, I think the whole idea of being concerned about the fragility of our social and economic systems, I think has become mm. a, lot, a lot more of a topic of conversation. So preppers make the step from, I guess, being worried um, to taking steps, right? So, and, and so sometimes that means stockpiling food. In Australia, it meant stockpiling toilet paper. Um, <laughs> and there were lots of, you know, lots of jokes, but you know, there's a whole, I won't, I won't tell you my theory about the toilet paper, I have a theory. Um, uh, you know, wealthy people buy bunkers. I think there's a lot of fetishization about the millionaires and the billionaires in the bunkers. Um, some people approach it very individualistically, trying to either save just themselves, maybe their loved ones or their family. Some people are sort of approaching it almost in a kind of anarcho-communist, -com hippie-ish kind of way, where it's like the system is not going to last and looking forward to a smaller, more communitarian, more sort of organic farming kind of market garden thing. So that, that's prepping in a nutshell, right? You might know some preppers, you might be a prepper. <laughs> If you are, please come and talk to me afterwards, because uh, I'm, I'm working on a book about this stuff. But I actually, I, so I started working on this book here, Living with the Climate Crisis, um, Voices from Aotearoa. And, and I was talking to a, to a lot of people, um, and there's, there's a lot of stuff in this book actually that's trying to sort of center um, Maori and Pacifica voices, people of color, lots of um, younger voices, a couple of teenagers, like people who were still in high school writing in that. Um, but the middle-aged white man I spoke to, <laughs> um, uh, and he'd, he'd been a really, intense climate activist, right? He'd sat on a vigil outside the New Zealand Parliament for a hundred days, rain or shine. He'd sat there saying, declare climate emergency, doing it all. And, you know, and it was sort of, you know, inspired by Greta Thunberg doing that kind of stuff. Um, in the process, he got, I guess, radicalized, like even further, and, you know, was speaking to a lot of green politicians. Um, you know, had a lot of people from, from countries other than New Zealand coming up to him and saying, I'm so relieved I've moved to New Zealand because my home country is a mess. I want my entire extended family to move over. And by the end of it, um, Ollie basically had a crisis and he was like, I, I, I think we're done. Like, I don't think politics is moving anywhere near fast enough. I don't think any of the political parties, including the Greens, are doing, even talking about doing enough of the things. And he's mm -hmm. like, I'm freaking out. I'm going to buy a house in a remote bush location and move there. And so he relocated. He's, he's lucky enough to be in a position where he has a job that he can do over his smartphone. He's sort of one of those, you know, tech dudes. Um, so him and his third wife and their two young kids have sort of moved to this property. And they were like, but, but really lovely. You know, he's like, he's not going to build a fence. He's not collecting guns. He's like, I want to have a utopian community. I want, I think we could feed about 50 people here. I'm doing organic gardening, growing. Um, you know, kale and, you know, nasturtiums and stuff. And I just want to, you know, get people in to join my community. And I want it to be really beautiful. And if, you know, if you want, my, if you want his email, we can talk later. But um, he was sort of like, ah, uh, but I also sort of, and I want it to reflect the full diversity of humanity, but it's still mine. Um, 
you know, I still want to be the boss, you know. Oh, and, and, and he was aware that was a paradox, but that was kind of the, some of the stuff he was grappling with. Um, Richard um, was a, a chap who I met in Wellington, um, capital of New Zealand, and, and that was so weird because I, I just started this project and I was, I was actually um, uh, going on a mountain bike holiday with some friends and I hadn't seen this, this friend Andy for a couple of years and Andy was like, how are you going man? Oh, pretty good. You know, what are you up to? Oh, I'm writing a book about preppers. You know, do you know any preppers? And he was like, yeah, my brother's a prepper. <laughs> He was on Radio National like last week. Here's the interview. You know, here's my brother's phone number. And so I was like, well, that was an easy in interview to get. <laughs> um, and he's, but he's again, a very sweet guy, very intelligent, very anxious. Um, but reading the same kind of stuff that I read and get anxious about, right? So he's reading George Monbiot, he's reading Naomi Klein, he's mm. reading, I mean, he's reading the, the deep adaptation stuff. So he's reading Jim Bendel and some of that stuff. But I was like, I was waiting for the moment where I was like, you're weird, like, this is unreasonable. And I was like, no, this is reasonable, this all checks out, you know? Um, and it was probably only the moment where he was like, and I'm training my children to fight with weapons, and here's our collection of wooden swords and our throwing stars and our axes and our um, this, and we do rough and tumble, but it's actually me training them to fight off people in the apocalypse. And at that point, I was like, well, that's pretty intense. Um, but that said, I don't have kids, I don't, ha I don't know martial arts, if I had kids and I knew martial arts, I'd probably want to teach my kids martial arts. You know? I, I would even say that that's not necessarily an unreasonable thing to do in the scheme of things. That said, I think he is also concerned he spends too much time doing martial arts with his kids. He is worried about turning them into, quote, little sociopaths. Um, so like, um, and so this is, this is sort of like, I guess, the dark side of it. Um, and and, you know, and I, think, I think that kind of more lurid, kind of slightly grotesque thing is what attracts people to preppers as a kind of thing to laugh at, like this TV shows, like the um, National Geographic Doomsday Preppers, and it's like, ha, ah, you're crazy. And I think there's aspects of that, but I've actually come around to being like very sympathetic to the, to the idea. Um, and I actually think it's potentially a very empowering idea in that it kind of like, it, it jumps through many layers of denial about the climate crisis, and it goes like, I think we're done. Like, I think everything's gonna fall apart really soon these are the steps I'm taking, you know? I'm turning my house into a bunker, or I'm growing my own food, or I'm doing this and that. And I think, I think it's actually a really powerful and empowering way to, to reframe things, because it's, it's like if you're at that point, you're like, well, we're done with capitalism, like we're done with global supply change, we're having to rethink everything. Mm. I actually think as a, as a way of, of, of thinking through other ways of living, I think it can be very empowering. Mm as well as some of the preppers being obsessed with buying cool stuff on eBay and Alibaba. <laughs> and it's like, I want the last set of Ziplocs, uh, you know, of like uh, Ziploc bags and, and cable ties before Alibaba collapses, you know, or I, I, I want to buy a crossbow with a net on it so I can shoot down a drone when it's trying to find my secret house in the bush or whatever. <laughs> well, that's, that's right. And climate, you know, psychologists that specialise in climate or eco-anxiety or climate distress, as they prefer to call it, these, they're very quick to point out that these responses are rational responses to the state of the world. Um, so, you know, that might be where it starts for all, some of us, all of us, people here now, but also for some of the folks that do end up, you know, going mm -hmm. down the road to becoming a prepper and joining that community where they find solidarity and support. So mm. it's so interesting, that journey that you're on. I can't wait to read your book. Mm. But um, I think what is the key to all of this is our relationship with nature because the other thing that climate psychologists also recommend is that connection with other people and connection with nature to explore that relationship is really critical. And Daryl, you've been um, thinking more around the human relationships with nature it is core to the work that you do around you know suburban birds and their relationship with the physical world as much as the roads projects we were talking about earlier but um but you're also thinking about you know how we can adopt um first nations ways of being and knowing so that we can be in relationship with the natural world um rather than considering ourselves as above it or nature is mm. subservient to to humans so what do you believe is required of humans at this moment for us to reset that relationship. That's a gigantic question. I mean, you know. Well, you should have. Well, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure we'll cover it in the next thirty seconds. So go for it. Um, now, well, if you like, I'll, I'll take you back to where it, where it all started. I mean, I, I got really interested in why people feed birds. You know, how trivial is that? Mm -hmm. um, and that and uh, that was an interesting thing to me because Australia is strange. It's the only country in the world where feeding birds is looked down upon for some reason. It's, it's regarded as something you should never do. Feeding birds, you know? Like around the world, it's, it's, it's a really thing, you know, thing that people do. It's a gigantic industry. 
So unfortunately, the only book of mine that's made it here is the book about that, which is called The Birds at My Table. But that's an interesting book. You should have a look at it. Um, but, but that was about trying to understand, well, what is it? Why do people reach out to, to feed wild birds? And that led me into this much deeper question of what is our relationship with nature actually like? Uh, and, there's, and there's two things which I, I, I'll talk about now. One of them was a vast field of research, an enormous field of research. Now, it's just unequivocal what, what's the, what, the, what the findings are. And that is human well-being, no matter where you live, no matter what your status in life, no matter how wealthy, wealthy you are, human well-being and, and appropriate mental health for all humans requires some connection with nature. Now, that might be simply the ability to walk down a street with trees. It might be something where you can hear birds singing. It might be having nice plants in your garden. Or it might be going forest, uh, um, yeah, forest bathing, you know, like the full extent and rolling in the leaves and naked, you know. It can be as all of those things, but an, a connection with nature is absolutely critical to our well-being. And that's not a surprise when you start thinking about it because we are the products of nature. And so the other thing that has profoundly changed my thinking is the fact that we have somehow thought for the last couple of hundred years, we're somehow separate, we're somehow different, we're somehow better than nature. Nature's this primitive thing out there that's a bit, you know, a bit uncivilised. We're different, we're, we're better than that, we're above that. Nothing could be further from the truth. And so my, my mission at the moment is to try and get people to start thinking, if they can, about how they relate to what nature is and what nature really is about and what natural really means. Because there's, yeah. there's no such thing as unnatural, really. If we, we think of the human sphere, of the things that we make and create, um, as being completely unnatural uh, and that nature doesn't have anything to do with it. So think, think for a moment about a, a structure that's made mostly of bamboo. And there's absolutely no nature in this because humans made it. Well, where did the bamboo come from? And why is a Javan, a pair of Javan munias, building a nest right in the middle of this, taking absolutely no notice of all these humans and getting on... It's going to be warm up there. It's going to be safe and dry. It's a perfect place for a nest. So there is a species, there's a representative of nature saying, we don't care what you, you know, you, you, you can you have all the hubris you like, you humans. We're just going to take advantage of the opportunities you provide. So the two things are, we need nature and we are in nature. We are nature. We can't avoid that. We have to take responsibility for it and, the way, and everything that we do. Can I throw a quick footnote onto that? Because mm. um, I love that, Daryl. And so... When I was in New Zealand researching my prepper book, one of the things that I ended up doing was like, well, I can't afford a bunker because I'm not a millionaire or a billionaire. Um, <laughs> the other thing that preppers do is they do bug outs, right? Where you go and hide in the bush and live off some cans that you've buried earlier. Um, <laughs> here's something I prepared earlier. It's some cans in a tube. Um, so I, I did that um, in the bush and, and just slept out under, under a tarp um, without a sleeping bag. For, for, for three nights. And I've done a lot of bushwalking. I've done a lot of camping. I love all that stuff. I love, you know, climbing mountains, whatever. But I've never just sat by myself quietly for three days, also sort of pretending I'm being hunted because um, it's the <laughs> apocalypse, so just being very quiet. And I just basically sat there for three days. And after I'd sort of set up my shelter and dealt with all this sort of, you know, at first it was quite stressful for the first 24 hours and um, all that. And I was like, what do I do now? I'm just going to sit here and meditate for 48 hours. And it was like so profoundly beautiful. And I just, every couple of hours, I felt like a new layer of nature revealed itself to me. Like the complexity of the vines, the, the leaf litter, the way that the, the light rise and fall. And by the third day, I just, I felt like I was learning more and more. And I could have, I could have stayed there for a very long time. And it was just like, it, it was so, it was so beautiful. And it was, um, yeah, and so, so no regrets, right? And I sort of feel like that, that kind of thing, um, yeah, I, I feel like the more of that, the merrier for, for all of us, really. We might move to some questions or reflections from the audience, and there's a one hand that's bolted up straight over here. So um, I think we do have a roving mic, perhaps, but if not, I can repeat your question. So please. 
Here, here comes the mic. Oh, uh, Mike's coming. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was uh, enthusiastic to ask a question. Um, actually, I'm not sure how to phrase it yet, uh, but I think uh, all of what the different speakers are touching on, I feel the, the deeper layer is also rooted in uh, colonial times. And uh, I'm, I'm, I think I'm very enthusiastic that um, colonialism and also decoloniality is b uh, a huge topic in this um, festival um, so far. Um, and so my question would actually be to maybe keep it simple. Uh, how do you um, uh, use that in your work? Um, I think because for me the missing link is as a white uh, woman, I think white people uh, of course um, pushed uh, colonialism, uh, took land back from indigenous people, lots of, um, uh, how to say, lots of uh, knowledge uh, was uh, gone through that. So uh, that's an important fact also to realize, I think. Uh, the, na the relationship with nature was also destroyed partly because of Christianity, and that made us think we are above uh, nature. So all these different aspects, I think, are, especially for white people, very uh, important to realize because often we don't really know where we come from, whereas we also have roots before colonialism. And I think if we as white people connect more with our roots before colonialism, also from ancestors who were much more linked to nature, um, then I think that will be a huge uh, contribution to solving climate change, <laughs> what we're going to do today, right? So, <laughs> so what, I would uh, so my question that. would be then, yeah. what is your um, idea about colonialism and uh, the influence and etc.? How do you bring that in your work? Who'd like to take that first? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll try, <laughs> I guess. I was hoping, do you want to start, Daryl? No, no, I, I, I'll, I'll wait for you. <laughs> yeah, um, no, I love this question. Uh, it's definitely a very complicated one. Um, I mean, the way that I think about colonialism uh, today is, I mean, it's so, it's the, it's the driving force of, even when we think about climate change solutions, right? It's still so drenched in like a colonialist uh, perspective. I think the way that a lot of people think that we need to uh, shift towards green growth and decouple like GDP and like you know build renewable energy uh, projects, what people don't understand is um, first of all like the 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 development of a lot of renewable energy power plants actually relies on um, exploitation of rare earth materials that largely also create land conflicts, mm -hmm. all sorts of problems in the global south. Mm -hmm. So it's like climate change happens because of over-consumerism um, and look, you know, vast growth happening in the global north. But we need to keep, we want to keep, the global north wants to keep consuming at this rate. It's just that we need now like new renewable energy resources that we will you know, exploit from the global south. Not to mention that a lot of the production then they export, like the emissions are actually being exported to China, to, uh, to, to all the producing countries, right? So that the global north can continue to consume, uh, but the emissions will be blamed on uh, the, the global south. Yeah. So it's definitely so intertwined, right? And like actually thinking about how to, how to address this and move fast and like thinking about decolonizing, uh, like what is the real solution that is actually fairer Acknowledging the history of colonialism, acknowledging that the Industrial Revolution started, uh, you know, in Western Europe, mm. uh, and all of that is is so important. But what I find, I, what I really struggle with, and like is is, is uh, you know quite conflicting, is a lot of COP negotiations, a lot of climate change negotiations, uh, often uh, you know find themselves in like a, a stalemate in a way that you know they keep pointing out to each other. You know, you know, like you know the the global north would say, that, oh no, no, but now the big the big emitters are the China and India of the world, the Indonesia of the world. Uh, but then Indonesia would say, yeah, but like look at the historical emissions. It's all your fault, so you need to do more, right? And so mm -hmm. I don't think this is like a mutually exclusive argument. It's not that, I think like both needs to happen at the same time, but there is that historical uh, origin sin responsibility, right? Where uh, the resources with which 
uh, we need to address climate change needs to come from countries that are endowed with more resources, uh, which in this case is the global north. And they need to acknowledge this. Like the, when we talk about climate financing, there's all these pledges about mobilizing 100 billion every year for climate, uh, for adaptation action in particular. And uh, the Glasgow uh, COP last time found out that they're barely meeting this, uh, you know, promise and all that. So th like, there's a need to actually use that framework, having uh, the awareness of of the colonial framework in, uh, you know, mobilizing the resources and what's right. But what I I find the most compatible, I think, like with with this awareness, is the this concept of degrowth. Um, with G where Jess Jason Hickel is like one of the I guess like primary proponents, but he's really summarizing a lot of the you know all the literatures before him, uh, all the writers before him, and it's also kind of deeply rooted in Marxism in a way yeah, as yeah. well. Uh, but I think like that's the fundamental question: Can we hold accountable the global north on actually like how they need to cut consumerism? Like how the material mm. footprint, not just the carbon footprint, right? Material yeah, yeah. footprint consumption in the global north countries are eight times above the like planetary boundary. Like it, they're overshooting already by a lot. And now we're putting pressure on like global south countries saying that, oh, you need to, you know, do better, reduce emissions and all of that. But what about uh, like this bigger justice, like the global justice uh, narrative in, in, in this perspective? So I think like I, I find many of the arguments that he's proposing compelling in a sense that we need like the, it's not enough that we are moving towards green growth in terms of transitioning to renewable energy, but still consuming it the way that we are. But we need to really hold global north countries more um, accountable to their own consumption patterns, yeah. um, allowing the global south to still develop, if possible, in a way that already is adopting like the more sustainable options. Because I also disagree with this. Oh, but we need to industrialize first in the same way. We need to pollute yeah. first before we, we get green. Mm. I don't think that we, need, we have more knowledge. We have more technology and resources to already leap forward and do development differently, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's that, that, that two, two elements where, you know, resources need to be channeled towards the global South countries to, uh, to le uh, do development already in, a, in a, a green pathway. And at the same time, global North countries need to have serious conversations between uh, their electorates and, and the politicians, right? About how to re, uh, you know, re build a better economic system where like they address uh, consumerism at the heart of it. Thank you. I'm going to move to one more question. And I will go to you because, again, quick with the hand, nice. Um, can we have the mic over here, please? Oh, the mic is gone, so I'll repeat your question. You look exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I still really love birds and, and particularly fond of scrub turkeys that uh, when I was your student, you did quite a few talks with us about your scrub turkeys that you were studying. Um, and I've been living in Indonesia for nearly 14 years now. Uh, my question is about climate change adaptation that you've all been touching on. Uh, our friend of mine was working at Griffith University when they were doing the climate change adaptation program mm. and research. But uh, I think quite a while ago, the funding was cut uh, for that program. And I know in Jakarta, there's a lot of money being put into um, climate change adaptation with stopping the floods and moving people and floodgates and everything to uh, adapt to climate change in Jakarta. Do you think there's enough being done in, in Australia, in the region, to research adaptation strategies and uh, for money? I know Afu talked about um, the funding for it, is there funding there and is it, is it happening? We no. turn to you. Oh, <coughs> short no. answer. That's encouraging, Daryl. <laughs> Did you want to say more? Did you no, want to no, say more? I think, I think um, Apu would be better placed to talk about this. How are we going on funding for adaptation in the relative you know, economic there, measures that we've got? Yeah. Mm. We're barely there. I think, um, I mean, we've been focusing the conversation a lot on mitigation, which obviously is important. Uh, but I think by and large, if you look at the map, so there, there are like these two really contrasting maps of where like the highest emissions come from and where the biggest impacts of climate mm. change would be for, and they're the exact flip of each mm. other, like mm. literally the flip, right? Like the uh, global South countries, especially African countries, small island countries in the Pacific are bearing most of the impact of climate change. They have very little, uh, they're very vulnerable, very little resources to, to adapt with it, uh, but you know, 
the biggest sources of emissions are coming from the global north. So that's, again, like a global justice issue, right? Um, and, and I think like, I, I, I understand that like, at the beginning of the conversation, we want to prevent the impact from getting too bad first. That's why like a lot of the conversation goes on mitigation action, but I think slowly like dis disasters are getting so bad, Pakistan, I think, like, actually mm. built a new momentum on the conversation around adaptation because a third of the country is underwater. A third of the country. It's not like mm. little, you know, cities in, 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 uh, in one country, uh, you know, get, gets flood, which is the case in Indonesia, but it's, it's everywhere. Um, so I think, like, that built a new momentum and conversation. I've been, you know, reading people writes uh, a lot of articles around, uh, that, you know, who's responsible for this, right? It's such a, diff it's a, a global public goods issue. Uh, it's like what it's a coordination in game theory, right? It's a global like international coordination issue uh, because the actions of many uh, has impacts on the few like less powerful um, countries. So it's uh, I mean, it's it's getting there. I can say that like there's new momentum to, to build upon, but it's barely it's very far from uh, from enough in, in terms of adaptation fund. Um, I would say, I mean, earlier we had breakfast and I, I, uh, there's, I came across this very interesting tweet in terms of, you know, how you know, climate change is basically like doing a study group, uh, uh, like paper, a group paperwork where uh, like there are six free riders, like nobody's doing the homework, especially the, the richest kids, and everyone gets the bad grades because of them, right? <laughs> it's literally like the few, the few rich countries uh, need to, to, to uh, get their act together or help the you know the, the poorer countries to actually uh, get ready for for adaptation. Um, mm. And the task yeah. will get harder yes. as we experience more impacts. And on that happy note, um, we are coming to time. So before we go, though, I I just have one question for all the panel. We might start with you, Tom. So you're all climate activists in one way or another through your writing and your work and your policy analysis and your lobbying. Um, I want to ask you all: Are you hopeful? for the next couple of decades? Or what's required of us if we can possibly remain hopeful at this point in human existence? Thanks for starting with me, Claire. <laughs> I love talking about hope. Um, just, just very quickly, three word answers for the other two questions. So I guess um, eat the rich um, and then Marie Kondo. Um, <laughs> but you know, that's glib, but just to be quick. But yeah, 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 we, we do need um, to change. I'm. I'm not hopeful that we'll be able to avert the worst of climate change. Mm -hmm. I feel like the, the graphs are going like that and we're riding the rocket ship into uncharted territory and I feel like we're already living in what we were meant to be scared of happening in 10 or 20 years. Um, I'm not hopeful that the rich and powerful people who have a stranglehold on economic systems and big industry are gonna stop being the <laughs> selfish fuckwits that they are. Um, I really am not, and I'm not hopeful that politics is going to turn around in time. And I, and I don't think, um, yeah, I don't think that the Green parties are, are even being radical enough. I, I get really hopeful about things like Extinction Rebellion when it started. I think there are lots of problems with the way it's been rolled out, and it, and it can be quite colonial. But when people started saying, headed for extinction, what are we going to do about it? glue ourselves to some banks and some trains. I was like, hell yeah. And like, when, I've, when I've met with those people and when I write books, and I, you know, a lot of my work is about activists, like mm -hmm. I get really, really hopeful there. Um, but I also feel like there's a, in a way, my hope is that like, you know, what do we worry about? We worry about dying. Um, mm -hmm. We worry about our friends and family, our loved ones dying, you know? And Western people in particular are really bad with that. Um, Secular people, like the, the fear of death thing, we're useless at it, we're really bad at it. Um, and I feel like in a way, climate change has kind of upped the ante, and it's like not just you're gonna die, your loved one's gonna die, everyone you know is gonna die, it's like, oh, the entire civilization that you know and love is gonna die, and, and the all animals. the stuff we have is gonna die. But I feel like there's a potential for some like deep, deep thinking and some beautiful enlightenment to come from that if we're willing to do the work. And I think it will take all of, all of our lives. But I think, I think there is the potential if we can let go all of that and find something else that, that it could be quite beautiful even if we we're don't, we're certainly not going to be flying to wonderful cushy rice festivals. You know, I, don't, I don't think that's going to be happening. But we, we could have something else very, very beautiful in, in the years to come, maybe. Maybe things will turn out okay, Daryl. What do you think? Uh, no, it's not. It's not going to turn out okay. But that's probably, <laughs> that's probably fine. That's probably fine. We because nature's not going to change. Nature will, no, sorry. Nature will change. Nature will cope with this. this it's it's done it 
billions of times before, long before we were here, mm -hmm. and long after we're gone. It'll still be here. The Earth will still be there with life on it. It probably won't be very friendly for us, but that's all right. There's no way that the governments of the world are going to solve this. It's going to be the people of the world that mm -hmm. solve this. Mm -hmm. It's going to be ordinary people saying, no, that's enough. We're going to do things differently from now on. And that's got to change the political system somehow. Because the political system at the moment is completely, you know what? You know, it's just not, not working at all. So there's, there's, there's got to be a change, and it won't be a change that we can even predict. But that there has got to be change, and that, that's where I'm hopeful. Arthur, do you have windows of hope through your work? I don't know, maybe a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the conversations that I have with my friends have reached a place where we talk about it's not just about whether we die. I think we've accepted that we will die in one way or another, but we talk about whether it will be a miserable death or <laughs> we can die with dignity. <laughs> Seriously, I've, at some point we talked about mm. maybe starting a like death with dignity service, like a suicide, because rather than, you know, there are different ways to die, right? There are, you know, good ways to die and bad ways, and like climate change really, ter the way that it terrifies me is that it will be a horrible death. Yeah. Um, sorry, this is like, this is coming off as very bleak, uh, <laughs> but I think, the, the hope, uh, whether I'm hopeful or not, is a little bit irrelevant in a sense that there's, I, I'm not going to not try to do something anyway. Uh, I might not be hopeful to the, full, like, to the fullest that I should be, but uh, I, I cannot sleep at night like not trying to do something about it, right? Um, so like a friend said that this, this business we're in, this business of you know, climate activism, whatever it is, is a business of banging our head to a wall hoping that the wall cracks before our head does. Because <laughs> uh, in the past 10 years, it feels a lot like, you know, things are moving really slowly, but I can't think about doing anything else other than, you know, still trying to keep banging my head, um, you know, to the wall and hoping that it will crack one day. Well, if you'd like yeah. to bang your head against a wall in a positive way, <laughs> there's a <laughs> Writing to Unite Humanity workshop tomorrow that I'm hosting and I'd love to <laughs> see you there. So... Se seamless segue there. Um, <laughs> but we are out of time. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. And please do thank Daryl Jones, Dr. Tom Doig, and Andita Yutami.